Would you mind terribly if I had a few words with my husband? Oh, okay. Now, I mentioned this movie in my soul food review, and I had a few comments requesting this one, so I had to do it. And being that New Year's is coming up, this movie is definitely right on time. Now, this review is for my girls, but trust that everyone is welcome. I love this movie, but I have to admit, I hadn't watched it in a while, so as I was watching it to review, some scenes really hit me hard, especially Bernadine's whole story baby oh my god I think this movie is one that grows with you as you age and as you experience different things because I saw each character in a whole new light and I have my thoughts and you already know we're gonna talk about it so let's get into it so it's New Year's and here we are we meet Savannah who is getting ready for a blind date she has not had any luck with men as of late, so much so that she has started to get really detailed about the type of men that she prays for. Yet and still, the pool of men she encounters are not it. The truth is most men are deaf. What they're best at is convincing us we should feel desperate. Thank God I don't fall for that shit. I mean... We then go to Bernadine, who is getting ready to go out with her husband or so she thought. He comes in and drops a bombshell on her that he's going to the party, but not with her. Now, sir, you let her get a babysitter, you let her get dressed, you let her get halfway done with her hair, and then you tell her this? Bruh. Then he proceeds to tell her that she, the other woman, doesn't wanna be alone tonight, and he would rather be with her. Then he flat out tells Bernadine that he's leaving her for the other woman. Now, Bernadine stays calm for a second, then it hits her. If you wait a minute, I give you 11 fucking years of my life and you're telling me that you're leaving me for a white woman? Would it be better if she were black? No, it'd be better if you were black. He then rubs salt in her wounds by saying her valid reaction made it even easier for him to leave. But understand, his mind been made up and there was nothing she could have done. No better way she could have reacted. His heart had been out that door and now his body followed. This was completely fucked up and it's not really a nicer way to say it. We then go to Robin. Robin is, she's a bit of a mess and completely man obsessed. We'll get to know a little bit more about her later. We then go to Gloria who's making herself a plate in the kitchen while her son, Tariq, is getting prepped for New Year's Eve. Gloria is one of those mothers that has made her whole life about her son, but not in the best way. She keeps a tight leash on him. It's almost like her son is her man, if that makes sense. But anyway, he's trying to convince her to let him stay out for New Year's Eve, but she is not having it. She tells him his father is coming to visit, and Tariq could care less. First of all, he's not my father, he's my daddy. And there's a big damn difference. Now you watch your mouth. Look, I see the bastard once every two years and I'm supposed to get excited? You get excited. I mean, I'm with him on that one. He's at an age where he sees things for what they are and it is what it is. We then go back to Savannah who made it to a New Year's Eve bash where she will be meeting her date. She tries to take a seat at a random table, but the women were hating, especially this one. So she decides to get up and go somewhere else. So Lionel walks up to Savannah, and this was the same guy who played in Soul Food. In fact, it was a few people in this movie that was also in Soul Food. I didn't realize this at first. But they go off to dance with each other, and the vibes are good. Savannah, for a split second, gets lost in the good feels. But just as soon as she does, it all fades. Lionel? My Lionel? You haven't danced with me all night. Now, I know this dude did not set up a date to meet somebody, and he came with a whole other person. Is that what happened? Child. We go to Gloria's salon where Jeffrey, one of the beauticians, tells the girls about Bernadine's situation. 
So uh, I guess you guys have heard, huh? What? John left Bernie. I saw her just the other night at the Circle K, and she was a mess. Robin and Gloria decide to call and check in on Bert and Dean. She doesn't answer, so they leave a voicemail. They are worried and pissed off about her situation. Bernie, this is Gloria. Honey, you call me at the shop, okay? We want to know what's going on over there. Now don't Bernie, how dare that son of a bitch leave you with two kids? Well, you just don't dump that up in here. Then we go back to Bernadine, who's laid up in the bed. She obviously has not slept. She's still in the same clothes, and she is just a mess. But she gets up and sends the kids off to school. Oh, but later, she gets angry. She goes to the closet and sees all this man's suits, watches, shoes, and she chooses violence. She starts going over all the things she went through, all the things that she had done over the years for this man. She put him through school, went and got her master's so that she could help him further his business. Start the catering business this year. Why don't you wait a few years, huh? Yeah, don't start it right now. Wait one, two, three years. I need you to be the fucking background of my foreground. He clearly wanted her to build him up, get him to where he wanted to be, and he never made the same sacrifices for her. And then he went so far as to count the many times they made love. Like, why were you counting? Who counts? And then he clearly had some self-hate issues. This was implied in their initial scene together, of which he tried to pass on to their kids by sending them to schools where they were the only black kids. Which is traumatic, let's just be honest. Me and my kids go to a school with only two other black children because you don't want them to be improperly influenced. Well, guess what, John? You're the one who fucking improper influence! Watching this scene from an adult perspective made me kind of emotional because I recognize this anger. And this is not, I'm just an angry, aggressive black woman and this is how I act when things don't go my way type of anger. This is, I am hurt. The man I loved never loved me like I loved him. I was his placeholder and I didn't even know it. I was his stepping stool and I didn't even recognize the signs. I did everything right Yet and still, I have nothing to show for it, and I'm mad as hell about it. And her feelings were more than valid. And honestly, he's lucky all she did was burn his wardrobe in that damn car. Honestly. So we go to Robin, who has her eyes on another man. She's desperately trying to find a new man to focus on instead of Russell, the man she really wants. Now, she doesn't even want Michael. And the whole time I was watching this, I couldn't help but wonder, what was the reason? If you don't even like this man, then why are you even giving your body to him? See, Robin used to worry about the wrong things. These men were selling her complete dreams, and she would go with it thinking they had intentions on being with her and taking her seriously. But no, not at all. She came off as naive, and she seemed younger than the other ladies, so maybe she hadn't gone through enough yet to know better but she made bad choices throughout this movie but anyway so her and michael are about to do the do it's not romantic at all she basically has to lead him to the water and poor guy was struggling with putting on protection you need some help? no see i'd have to double check he didn't look too confident now i can't play this scene but I just have one question. Was he, was he even in? If I was her, I would have blocked this out. I wouldn't even add him to the tally. It didn't happen. So Michael decides to ask her what she needs so that he can provide it for her. She tells him what she desires from a man. She tells him that she wants to have kids. She wants a home in Scottsdale. She wants to go away for long weekends and that she wants to be happy. He then tells her that she doesn't want much and that he can provide all that. I'm saving my opinion on this for the final thoughts cause girl, girl. So we go back to Bernadine and Savannah has arrived to check up on her. Baby Bernadine is not doing so well. She's playing old videos of her and John in the background. She's down bad and she has every right to be. I always thought if I gave him what he needed, he'd give 
me what I need. It's amazing what can happen when you give a man control over your life. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't work that way, my love. So we go to Gloria. Tariq's dad has come by, but Tariq isn't there. This whole exchange was awkward. She basically goes on to say that the last time he did a favor by spending the night with her and she hopes he does the same again. Like you're looking healthy. <laughs> Child. Gloria could care less about Tyreek seeing his daddy. She wants him to herself tonight. Tyreek's dad finally has to let her know the truth, that he's no longer bisexual, he is gay, and only wants to date men. He then tells her to let Tyreek know that he will only be available for one more day, then he's gone. See, that's why Tyreek don't fool with him. Back to Bernadine. She's having a garage sale, and baby, everything is for a dollar. Everything. I wish I could have been there for it. I would have racked up. These kids start fighting over the wagon and end up breaking some items. Bernadine is not worried about it at all. Now we go to Savannah and she meets up with Lionel, a sneaky link, if you will, or whatever y'all calling it these days. She lists off a few things she's learned about him and they don't sound good. He has no job, he smokes weed, and he claims he's a vegetarian, but he's not. I gave him $20 for gas, which came to $7.18, and he didn't even give me my change. Child, you had change back, back then? I know this is the 90s. We wish. So, baby, Lionel goes to Savannah, and he doesn't warm up the engine. Baby, he just goes straight for the gas. And it seemed like it was a complete waste of time. He really thought he was doing something. We go to John, who's currently leading a meeting, and in comes Bernadine. Would you mind terribly if I had a few words with my husband? Oh, okay. Turns out, John has taken all the money out of the accounts. Money they both work hard to attain, and he wants her to sell the house. And go where? With what money, sir? Oh, this scene burns my gears. But as soon as she reminds him that she, in fact, started his firm, he tries to dial it down and suggests that they try to keep things amicable. Business hasn't been good for years, but don't you worry about it. You'll get what's coming to you. How? I'm not worried. You, on the other hand, should be. This man, I swear. So we go back to Gloria, who goes looking for Tyreek, and baby Tyreek is in the pool getting grown. While she's going off on him, she lets it slip that Tyreek's dad is gay. Tyreek doesn't take this too well. He ends up upsetting Gloria and tries to apologize, but Gloria doesn't want to hear it and uses it as an excuse as to why he can't go to Spain. But in reality, when he leaves, she will be all alone and she doesn't want to deal with that. So Bernadine is meeting with her divorce lawyer. Turns out that everything that her and John acquired while they were together is in his name. While she's been focused on the family, he was securing his future, and it's fucked up. With everything that she's going through, she tries to convince Gloria to allow her to cut her own hair. I'm not doing this. What is the fucking big deal? No, I'm not doing Gloria. it. You know what? They are going back and forth, and suddenly Bernadine decides to chop off a nice little chunk to get the party started. Now, everybody knows if a woman is newly single and she cuts her hair, oh, it's a wrap. It's over. It's done. And her and John are a memory she will never care to revisit. You want me to cut it? I cut it. How short do you want it, huh? You want it shorter than mine or short as mine? You know, I can always use a razor, too. I can't believe you. So later, all the girls get together and go to the club. Bernadine is trying to get her groove back, so she goes out to dance, as she should. How you like that new haircut? I don't like it. Um... I like it. You like it? Yeah, look at her. Girl, make up your mind. <laughs> so Bernadine comes across his ex-pro ball player and catches his eye. They start to dance together and they're having a good time. So while this is happening, Michael, Robin's ex-fling, comes in with a new girl and Robin is in her feelings. Honestly, girl, you didn't even like him like that anyway. Robin. Did you see Michael? Oh, she's on. Michael who? 
and Robin ends up doing what she does best, falling into another man's arms. So her new fling, Troy, who she's only known for three days, invites her out. This whole date situation was a mess because what kind of conversation did y'all have in three days that gave him the idea that you would be cool with going to the trap house? Girl, I can't. This man really took her to the drug den, y'all. Like it was the movies. Like it was a restaurant. Child. So we go back to Savannah, who's at work, and she's checking her voicemail. She receives one from Kenneth, who lets her know he'll be in town soon for a medical conference and would like to see her. She doesn't have to wonder how he got her info. She knows her mom was behind this. Ah, girl, he gonna be out there on the 26th. Ain't you excited? Mama. Now, her mom knows this man is married, yet and still, she gave him her daughter's number and wants them to date. To her, any man is better than no man, even if he's someone else's. Every woman needs a man, and you ain't no exception. So Savannah vows that she won't look into his eyes, squeeze him when he hugs her, or give him any. But yeah, we, we shall see how that works out. So we go back to Robin, who is upset with Troy. It's been three days, and he's in your house. Girl, he could be crazy. I mean, he could be completely psycho. Robin, sis. So she tells Troy that maybe they need to cool off for a while, and then he hits her with this. My mother wanted me to invite you over for a barbecue. Oh, you think I'm making all this up? Because you mad. So she instantly tries to make excuses for his drug use in her mind. She thinks she could be a positive influence on him. It don't work like that though. Honestly, forget him and his mama. This is red flag territory. So Bernadine and Gloria are at a fair and Bernadine is telling Gloria about all the things that John hid from her. This man had a whole apartment building 200 acres of land and a vineyard. Meanwhile, he wanted her to sell the house for money. This man came up off the back of Bernadine, but wants her to figure it all out, minus the wealth that came from her input and contributions. Dude is wild. So later, Gloria asks Bernadine if she had been messing around with Herbert, the guy from the club. And yes, she has. Though it was only one time, but he started acting possessive after and she had to end it. Bernadine then told Gloria that she wasn't like her and that she needed a man. But truth be told, Gloria is in the same boat and she was just hiding it behind her judginess. Is that a word? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? She was pining over Tyreek's daddy for how many years? Cutting herself off from what could have been. She may not have shown it like Robin or Bernadine, but she still fell in the same category. We go to Savannah and Robin who are on the phone together. Robin is telling her about how she's through with Russell and is focusing on Troy. Savannah is trying her best to knock some sense into her, but it's not working. What have you done in three days with this man besides screw him? That would make knowing you so deep that now he wants to take you home to meet his mama. Turns out her wallet is missing, and we don't have to think too hard about where it went or who got it, but to Robin, it's still a mystery. Child. During their call, Russell calls on the other line, and baby Robin damn near breaks her neck to let him come over. I've been missing you, baby. Since when? Since I've been gone. Want some coming? Yes. I'll see you in 15. Now she was just saying she was through with him. Now he on his way girl stand up so russell comes over and they get straight to it so clearly russell only comes over for one thing and robin hangs on to each and every one of his excuses like their truths oh he would have spent the entire night but he had to take his mama to church and people change you can't hold their past against them like girl these aren't mistakes they are very intentional and not equally beneficial but hey, if she likes it. So baby, fast forward to this scene. Hey, hey, Woo. five minutes, hey. Robin gets a little bit of sense 
or maybe her mind is clouded by Russell, but she decides to let Troy go. Baby, he didn't show up at her house in a leather vest with no shirt under it. Baby, this is Arizona. It's hot. And this is how you show up and you trying to take me where? Boy, bye. And then he brings up a son that Robin knew nothing about. But then they've only known each other for a couple of days at this point. So, I guess. And I know her neighbors were living listening to all of this. Could you imagine having your ear to your door and hearing this? Don't you throw that up here! You raggedy bitch! And because I can't play the whole scene, she said, Troy, take your drunk ass, leather wearing in the summertime, need a shave, stinky ass home. And then she told his ass to be gone. It's like that then. Bye! I really wish she had this strength with Russell. So Gloria goes over to meet the next door neighbor, and baby, she is walking. She thinks she's talking to one of the movers and tries to be nosy and asks us about the neighbor. But it turns out that the mover is actually her neighbor. She's eyeing him up and down, inviting him to dinner and shit. Would you like to have dinner with us tonight? It's just leftovers. Collard greens and cornbread, some candied yams, a little potato salad, fried chicken, peach cobbler, fruit slices of ham. Oh, she makes a self-deprecating comment about her weight, which is not cool. But her neighbor lets her know that his late wife was a plus-size woman and he doesn't mind a little extra love. For a second, Gloria leaves her body and has a moment of pure bliss and comes back too. She tells him that she'll have Tariq come and drop off a plate later and she walks away. I'm afraid about watching me walk away. <laughs> All right. He's watching <laughs> So we go back to Bernadine and she's currently in divorce court. Things are not going her way so far and she's upset, rightfully so. She overhears him talking to his lawyer and how he wants the divorce over with ASAP and how it's affecting the kids. But he also wants her to sell the house and settle for 300000 Baby, you are sitting on acres of land, a vineyard, real estate that you would not have acquired if it wasn't for Bernadine. And you expect her to settle? He's lost his mind. So Bernadine goes down to get a drink from the hotel bar and meets James. Bernadine isn't open to conversation at first, and he's trying to flirt a little to open her up, but she's not having it. He then tells her that he looks forward to going home to his wife, and she softens a little, and she tells him that she's there due to her divorce. He then tells her that she's a fighter, and she doesn't look like what she's been through. Basically, the whole strong black woman thing, this shit is not a compliment. He then tells her that he recognizes a fighter when he sees one due to his own wife currently fighting for her life due to breast cancer. The walls come down between them and he offers to buy her another drink. Uh, she'll take another whatever she got. Scotch and soda. Ooh. Scared of you. <laughs> We go back to Savannah. Kenneth has made it into town and he's there to see her. While they're on their date, they bring each other up to speed about what they've been up to. So we get a slight backstory of their love and honestly, it was confusing, but I'm thinking that they were dating and they didn't know how to properly communicate. While Savannah was waiting on him to express interest and take the reins, he took this as her not being interested and he dumped her. Seemed kind of childish, but he then tells her that even though he's married, he only married his wife because she was five months pregnant at the time. So basically he did it out of obligation and not love. This is still something that happens so much. And honestly, this is red flag territory as well. But Savannah trusts his word and she does everything that she said she wouldn't do. She kissed him, she hugged him tight, and she most definitely gave him some. So we go back to Bernadine and she invites James to her room. Before they proceed to do the do, he tells her that his wife is white and that he loves her. Now Bernadine doesn't kick him out, nor does she get angry. At this moment, she sees his pain and realizes that they're both hurting, but in different ways. What do you want to do tonight? 
make the night beautiful. They ended up not having sex, but just enjoyed each other's company and received the comfort that they both really needed. Meanwhile, Gloria and Marvin are getting along really well. He's building her a gazebo, she's making him sandwiches, they are hanging out with Tyreek, it's going well. So we fast forward to Gloria's birthday and the girls are toasting. Of course, Savannah and Robin are being silly, but Bernadine wishes her peace of mind and true happiness. It was definitely well-rounded though, but then she goes to blow out the candles. <laughs> This is why I don't eat cake at children's birthdays parties because, mm, especially post-COVID, I'm just saying, don't judge me. So a little later, they're all drunk and laid out, sad songs are playing in the background, and Bernadine is fuming. That lying asshole. I should call him right now. So Bernadine gets up and decides to call John so she can cuss out the mistress. Robin decides she wants to help. Johnny? Hello? No, it's not John, bitch. Gloria tries to convince Bernadine to step off the ledge and let him go. She tells her that what she's doing is stupid and childish. I guess that's what she needed to snap back because she asks about the music and remembers this is Gloria's birthday party. So they get back to the fun, dancing and drinking, and afterwards they're sitting by the couch and talking. I'm 73 years old. Ooh, good. And I still look good. <laughs> I still look good. You think you look good, girl? <laughs> Child, back then they tried to make it seem like 33 was so old, girl. The girls finish out the night with some much needed laughs and girl talk. Some days later, Savannah meets up with Kenneth again. She's back in deep with him. She decides to call her mom. She finds out that her mom is struggling. Her food stamps were cut to $57 a month, and she only has $57 to her name at the moment. Savannah tells her to go down to Western Union in the morning so that she can send her some money. The conversation quickly switches to Kenneth. She doesn't tell her mom about Kenneth, but she does tell her that she doesn't know if she can trust them which is valid, and her mother just laughs it off. Later on in the morning, Savannah brings him breakfast. He's on the phone with his wife. So you tell her that her daddy loves her. Yeah. Me too. Notice he didn't say, I love you too. He said, me too. Trifling ass. I wouldn't trust him either. Anyway, we go back to Gloria and Marvin and they're arguing about Tyreek. Gloria doesn't want him to go to Spain. She's being selfish and doesn't want him to leave. Marvin is trying to convince her that this is an awesome opportunity for him. It will be great for him to experience. She's trying to convince Marvin to talk some sense into him, but all she's doing is trying to move him in the direction that's most comfortable for her and that's just wrong. And Marv calls her out on it and she's not happy about it. Well, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Good night. Gloria. Good night. So we go back to Robin. Russell has convinced her, yet again, that he's leaving his wife for good this time. So Russell finally shows up, and he looks pissed. She asks him what took so long, and he tells her that him and his wife talked, and that divorce isn't as easy as signing on the dotted line. Straight gaslighting her per usual. And then she asked him did he sleep with his wife and of course he didn't answer. This is a complete joke. She then gets a call from Troy. Why he's still calling, I I can't understand. I suggest you tell your boyfriend not to call me after 11. Boy, if you don't get it. Boy, bye. We go back to Gloria and Tariq and they're in church. During the announcements, Gloria surprises Tyreek by having the pastor announce that he's going to Spain with Up With The People. He's super excited and happy that his mom finally agreed to let him go. Marvin's words got through to her. Thank God. So Savannah and Robin are chilling by the pool talking about their love lives and Robin brings up a point that they're starting to sound like the women on talk shows. 
She then tells Savannah about a story she saw on one of those talk shows that was similar to Savannah's situation. The man kept saying he was going to leave his wife and the woman moved down to the same city he was in to get closer to him. She found out soon after that she was three months pregnant and ended up having an abortion and never told anyone, not even her mother. When Savannah asks her what show this was on, it's then when Robin tells her that this was her story and this is what she experienced. I wish that we got to know more about Robin in this movie. I feel her and Savannah kind of got lost. I probably have to read the book though to learn more about the characters. We go to Bernadine who has received a letter from James, the guy she met at the hotel. He goes on to tell her in the letter that he thinks about her often and that he's fallen in love with her. But even though he has those feelings, it hasn't undercut the love that he has for his wife. He goes on to tell her that she has changed his life and that she has given him hope that life goes on and something beautiful will be out there waiting for him and the same for her. We go back to Savannah who's meeting up with Kenneth again. Before he even asks her how she is, he comes to the table complaining about how his daughter has a chicken pox and that his wife keeps calling him every hour on the hour about their daughter and basically he doesn't want to be bothered. So why do you even come? Why? Because you are the most important thing in my life. More important than your child? This is when Savannah knew this ain't it. Soon enough, she will be the wife and he will be talking the same shit to someone else. That's if he ever leaves his first wife. And it turns out he follows the same storyline as Robin's story and tells Savannah that it's going to take a little bit longer for him to leave his wife. And baby, that's all Savannah had to hear. You see, the more I think about it, the more I look at you, you look like the scum of the fucking earth. And then Savannah breaks it down for him. No, I'm the lucky one. The most important thing in your life. Meaning, you'll abandon your wife and your child to get laid every chance I give you. And you think, you think the brass ring is some bogus promise to put me into Paula's shoes? So you can do the same fucking thing to me next year? She read him down. All truth, no bullshit. And from here on out, her and Kenneth are done for good. So of course, she didn't have to wait too long for her mother to get the news. And why Kenneth call her mama and tell her their business? Child, if Savannah was my kid, I would have had some words for that man. But anyway, Savannah had to put her mother in her place, as she should have done a long time ago, honestly, because she was doing way too much. Ma, I'm smart, I work hard, and I'm a good person. Ma, you should be proud I'd rather live alone than crawl up behind some two-timing loser like Kenneth. So she goes on to tell her mom about the many things that she's got going for herself. But none of that seems to matter. It all boils down to her mother not wanting her to be alone like she is. But she doesn't recognize that even if her daughter is single, she is miles ahead of her mother. She is able to move how she wants to. She is financially good. So good that she could actually afford to take a pay cut for her current position. And she's not trapped in an unhappy relationship or an unhappy marriage. She won. And her mother should be proud. But yet and still. He's a good man, Savannah. Now I understand why she said what she said. It was disrespectful as hell. But I get it. But it's sad it took all of this to get through to her mother and for her to see things from Savannah's point of view. So Bernadine finally gets some good news. In the divorce settlement, she got $1.5 million, a second home in Mexico, $100,000 in stocks and bonds, and a Mercedes station wagon. He was hiding all of this from her. He came up off of her and didn't want to give her nothing. Talk about sell the house. Child, now he got to go home and explain this to his new woman. Justice served. We go back to Robin. Russell is knocking at her door, but this time things are different. He tells her that he finally left his wife, but Robin is not swooning like she used to. She refused to let him in. 
He sees a book she's reading about childbirth and asks her why she's reading it. Like he don't know what's up. So Robin lets him know that yes, she is in fact pregnant, but no, she doesn't want or need his help. It took a lot for her to do that. I was proud of her and happy that she was proud of herself. We go to Gloria, who's come to Marvin to apologize about walking out, and she acknowledges that she didn't want to hear the truth, but she's thankful that he was honest with her. Initially, Marvin doesn't seem receptive, so she tries to leave, but he stops her. She starts to tell him about Tyreek and how she misses him already, and that he's been the man in her life, and now she has to adjust to being home alone and dealing with that. In the midst of this conversation, Marvin admits that he loves her. All these years, Gloria thought she was unworthy of love, but Marvin saw right through that. Now, it's New Year's Eve again, and the ladies are all on the other side. Bernadine is divorced and happy. Savannah and Robin are fuckboy free. And Gloria is finally in a loving relationship and has learned to relax the reins on her son. We love to see it. And that's the end of the movie. So here are my final thoughts. I'm going to start with Robin. Robin, child. Robin was naive, maybe a bit immature. She made bad decisions when it came to men. I don't believe her age was mentioned in the movie, but she came off younger than the rest of the women. So maybe lack of experience played a part in her decision making. I'm not sure. But she was clearly hung up on Russell, and since she couldn't have Russell how she wanted to have him, she tried to fill his role with randoms instead of focusing on herself and seeing why she kept attracting the same type of men. When we look at what she told Michael about what she wanted, she said, I want kids, I want a family, I want to eat out, I want a home, I want to be happy. These are all things that were surface level. And the whole time I was like, that's it? That's all you That's all you want out of life? And clearly she wasn't happy. And she felt like once she had those things that she would be. But I feel like she was selling herself short. And I wish that we could have explored more of her story because she just came off ditzy. Like she was making bad decisions just to make bad decisions. And I wish we could have learned more about her why. But like I said before, there's something that's probably discussed more in the book. Now, Gloria was a bit of a mess. <laughs> Gloria put all her energy into her son and got lost in being his mom, which is not a terrible thing, but it can be when you forget to leave some room to focus on yourself. She let herself go, and I'm not talking about her weight. She stopped focusing on the things that made her happy, things that she wanted to do, dating, exploring. She let all those dreams and wishes for herself go and focused on just being Tyreek's everything. While the girls all looked at Gloria as someone who had it all together and didn't need no man, Gloria was so cut off, judgmental, and insecure, she was hanging on to Tyreek for dear life. And I'm so happy that Marvin was able to get through to her and gave her the push she needed to let Tyreek go and explore the world. I mean, the boy is trying to be a part of an international choir of all things. Let him go to Spain and experience new things. I loved Marvin and Gloria's relationship and how he saw right through her. It was really cute. So on to Savannah. Savannah was such a dope character to me. She was very honest, relatable, and real. She told her girls what they needed to know, and she was real with herself. The whole time she was with Kenneth, she kind of knew that it wasn't right. And even when she spent time trying to talk herself into being okay with Kenneth, deep down she knew that it was never going to be the ideal situation. Even with her mom in her ear trying to convince her that any man is better than no man and all that BS, she knew in her gut that that whole situation was not right for her. And honestly, she had so much going for herself. She was successful, financially secure. She could move how she wanted to. If she was my daughter, I would have been so proud of the move she was making. I would care less about if she had a man or not. What's so crazy is that Savannah is not the norm for women. 
Women are now focusing on going to school, starting their businesses, getting certs, and going into tech and other high-paying industries, making six-figure salaries, buying homes on their own, traveling, doing all these things, and I love to see it. There is so much more to life than being a wife and a mother, and women should have the opportunity to explore life and do everything their heart desires without going through the child to adult to mother pipeline. And to further drive home their point, Bernadine's story is the reason why women have transitioned to where and how they are now. Her story has happened to so many women over and over and over. Bernadine literally put her dreams to the side to support her husband. She got her master's in order to help her husband further his business. She was his secretary, his bookkeeper, the mother of his kids, she was the main reason he was as successful as he was and he wanted to leave her basically destitute. I mean, she gave him her all, put all her eggs in one basket, did everything right, and it all counted for nothing. And John, child, he gained so much off of the back of this woman and he couldn't stand her. He could have cared less about having about her having the ability to take care of herself, being that she is the mother and the caretaker of their kids. I don't understand that. All throughout this movie, he moved like he hated her. He didn't move like someone who used to be in love with her. And he clearly had some self-hate issues going on. And even though there was some focus on him leaving her for a white woman, notice how she didn't respond with anger or resentment when James told her that his wife was white. She was able to recognize that he loved his wife for no other reason than he just truly loved her. It wasn't because, oh, well, black women are angry. They're difficult. They're aggressive. He simply loved his wife because he loved his wife. And contrary to popular belief, that's not an issue. That's actually a great thing. But John was chasing a life and an image that he couldn't have with Bernadine as his wife. And even though it hurt like hell, John leaving her was the best thing that could have ever happened to her. She deserved so much more and the energy she put into him and their relationship should be put into her and the things that she wants to achieve. I still can't believe he was hiding all their property and money from her. He was incredibly selfish and just low down in general, a real asshole. So all in all, this is such a great movie and has aged so well. I miss movies having soundtracks and let me say the Wayne to Excel soundtrack plays like an album. It's still so good. Every song hits and baby, that's when singers were singing. Cause y'all know the, R the new R&B girls ain't delivering bridges like they used to. Child, they too busy singing in cursive. So y'all, tell me this, what's your favorite song on the soundtrack? Mine is, and will always be, How Could You Call Her Baby. I feel like that track was so underrated, but it's so good. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. If you would like to request a movie for me to review, please let me know and I will add it to the list. Please comment, like, and subscribe to see more. And as for my next review, y'all do remember Mr. Clark, right? See y'all later. Bye.